let's welcome the magnificent Lenny James. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Um, so I was looking back at your um, uh, magnificent career and um, you, in one interview, you talked about how you hadn't really uh, wanted to become an actor until you actually started acting. And was that um, at, the, at the National Youth Theatre where you went or was that at drama school at Guildhall? At what point did you think, actually, yeah, this is what I want to do? Um, I had said to my family that I wanted to be an actor just before auditioning to drama school. Um, I don't think I really took it seriously until my second year at drama school. I mean, I, 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 there was just a moment where I just was like, actually, um, not only do I want to do this, I want to do this for as long as is humanly possible and I want to be good at it. And um, yeah, and that would have been my kind of second year at drama school. My first year at drama school, I felt, um, I felt really kind of um, exposed and kind of like a fish out of water. I, I didn't know nearly enough to be there and felt like a bit of a phony and spent a lot of time hiding away. I went to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, spent quite a lot of time hiding away down in the basement where the, the kind of musicians were, the, um, the kind of guys who were on the jazz course and guys who were part of reggae philharmonic and all of that kind of stuff. I kind of hid with them for a bit. Um, but in the in my second year, I kind of went back up onto the the actors' floor and got on with it. So presumably there were you know was, there were like two or three other black people in the acting part of of Guildhall at that time in your in your in your. It's uh, to be honest, I've got to give them credit. Um, when I auditioned for drama school, I auditioned for Central Rada and the Guildhall, and um, and I got into Rada and the guild hall and i felt whether i don't know rightly or wrongly although i do kind of know that if i um when i didn't go to rada that they gave my place to another black actor um but when i um was offered a place at uh, guild hall they they offered places to three other black people two other guys and one girl and um and that influenced my choice really i i didn't want to be the token for want of a better phrase. So um, I have to give Guildhall credit that, you know, back in 85, um, it wasn't great diversity, but it was more diverse than most. And do you think the experience that, that you had from, from maybe the second year, more, more, as you say, more than the first, do you think that's key to, 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 how, to how you've shaped your, your career? And do you think it would have been very different? Do you think now, for example, if people are thinking of, not going to drama school, um, you know, and maybe they think it's not the place, particularly for working class people, I don't know, that you would say they should and because, uh, because of what you learned there? Um, I think on one level, everybody has to make the um, decision for themselves. But when people ask me, do you have any advice for my kid or my friend or me who wants to get into acting, I always say study how you go about that study is entirely up to you. Um, I think that it would have been much harder for me now to go to drama school in the way that I went to drama school and get from it what I got from it. It would be much harder for me to do that now than it was then. Um, you know, for me, I, I mean, I've said this before, I went to drama school to find out the things that everybody else knew and the things that I felt kind of lacking in. I would I would do make the same choice again, but um, and particularly for working class actors, I think if there's not enough opportunity or not enough room at drama schools for working class actors or um, uh, people from um, black and ethnic minority communities, then drama schools are failing. Absolutely, um, and you were writing from quite quite in that period as well, I believe. I remember listening to you. On Craig Parkinson's um, brilliant podcast, the epic podcast you did, where you talked about how you wrote theatre review, you, you did theatre reviews for Capital Radio, um, you were you wrote an episode of The Bill, you wrote a play when you were at National Theatre. So that must have been something that you, that you were interested in right from the start. Was was it was it that as of interest to you as the acting, the writing? I did. I did. Do you know what? Every single thing I did ended up being on Capital Radio, winning a playwriting competition, writing a play. 
acting, everything I, I did out of ignorance. I was, I've always been my most successful out of ignorance. When I didn't have a clue what I was doing or what I was on about um, seems to be um, how it's worked out best for me. But yeah, I did. I acted in my first play at the Cockpit Theatre in Marlebone when I was 16. And um, I wrote my first play when I was 17 because a friend I'd made at the Cockpit Theatre bet me that I couldn't. And, uh, and I could. And I didn't have a burning ambition to write, pretty much like I didn't really feel like I had a burning ambition to act but then when I started acting I did I mean I loved it and it was what I want, kind of wanted to do and when I you know when I wrote my first play I had no idea what to do with it so I entered it into the National Youth Theatre playwriting competition and I won and you know the you know me and I shared the most promising playwright under 21 kind of um, award and um, and then I joined the Lyric Youth Theatre in Hammersmith um, under um, uh, um, working there with the youth theater and with Lucy Parker. And, um, and th that was as much my training as kind of anything, because I wrote and acted with that theater company and that kind of solidified what it was that I wanted to do in this industry. And what do you think, you talked about the teachers, um, being in importance to you do you think mentoring is that was that a key part of your development did you have people other people who gave you particular insights and helped you particularly and um you know um played particularly close attention to you yeah i think it was i think mentoring is um really in, important and i try to do my fair share of it um uh as much as i can um I think it's a. I think it's a twofold thing. I think that there is a, as much as there is not necessarily a responsibility, but as much as if it's something that you want to do, you should pass on your um, on your knowledge. I think it's really important for young actors, young artists to seek advice and and, and mentorship from um, artists who have gone who have kind of gone before. And I and I was, if I credit myself with anything, I was quite good at taking advice or um, um, thoughtfully um, realizing why that advice wasn't helpful for me and I was I was lucky right from the beginning I mean I think um, somebody had asked me a, a few um, into many interviews ago um, you know who were the people who are most influential uh, in my career um, for what it, whatever that amounts to and I would I would have to put Lucy Parker as one of those people who was the uh, who ran the youth theatre at the Lyric in Hammersmith. She um, um, a lot of what she thought was good acting or good writing is what I still try and strive for, um, and um, in finding truth in both of the things that I do. And you know, if if she would certainly be on my list along with Hor Horace Ove and um, and a good few others, really. And looking at your career, the the early days, the, the, I'm interested in the build up to um, to Berridge, your first kind of big, juicy lead role on TV. Um, and first of all, you, you talk about I think it's very interesting when you talk about making the right decisions and, and turning down certain roles. Was that as important to you, turning down the wrong things for you, as it was finding the right thing for you? Um, it was unavoidable, to be absolutely honest, Boyd. Um, I was a I was part of a um, arguably the kind of first generation of, uh, of um, drama school graduates coming into the industry, and um, and as a black actor, my, you are immediately um, whether you like it or not in a political environment, and you are a you have to become a political being. Whether you, you whether you focus on it or you don't focus on it, you have to navigate it. And one and one way in which you navigate it is by saying there are certain roles, certain types of roles, because we are so easily stereotyped that we're, I'm not gonna do. And, and I did that. I think it's part of the reason why I've stayed with my agent for such a long time is it took me a long time to train her up and to the things that I would do and I wouldn't do. And I don't wanna have to start all over again with that. 
So, um, so yeah, there are, you know, it wasn't always, it wasn't as kind of, for me anyways, it wasn't as clear cut as it was about ambition. It was about, you know, getting to be a leading actor. I wasn't thinking in those terms at that particular moment in times. It was just that I didn't want to play muggers. Um, mm -hmm. If all that was, if all that was going on about that part was that it was a mugger. I didn't want to play pimps if the only thing that distinguished that character from any other character was that it was the black pimp. I didn't want to play any parts where the, the, the way, it, the only way it was described was that it was the black fill in the gap. Um, mm -hmm. that, that wasn't of interest to me. And luckily, um, you know, I had options. So, um, you know, there wasn't lots of periods of where I was choosing between working and not working. Um, I was lucky enough to be in situations where I was picking between jobs. And when I had those options, I tried to make the choice that I could live with. I believe it was Stephen Graham, your friend Stephen Graham, who, who first alerted you to Buried and um, said it was perfect for you. And I watched, I was watching some of it back um, in preparation for this. And first of all, it has not dated. It's extraordinary how really? it still comes up. Yeah, it's incredible. Excellent. And a large part of that, I think, is the very, is the naturalistic acting of everyone. The whole cast seems absolutely on it. And it feels very, you know, documentary style, very, and all of that. Can you pinpoint why that role was perfect for you? Um, because at its heart, it was, um, I, under, I absolutely understood that character. I absolutely understand, understood his impetus to kind of, um, uh, to step up and try and protect his sister. And at, his, and at the heart of the, the story is a man who acts impulsively um, and ends up someplace he is not equipped to be. And I am not equipped to be in prison. And, um, and, but the rules by which Lee uh, Kingsley kind of operated his life were not that dissimilar to the way that I was trying to operate mine. I just, I just, I just got him. I mean, it's basically the story of a, a regular fellow who ends up in a, um, a, a place that he's, like I said, he's not equipped for. And it just, it, it, it just, he just made, he just made sense to me. And, um, and I was talking to someone else about it the other day that, you know, that I put myself out there to get buried in a way that I certainly hadn't up until that point and haven't really since put myself out there. I mean, I, you know, they, they wouldn't see me for a very, very long time in part because they thought I was too familiar to television and they were going for this gritty kind of realism and, um, and they didn't think I was up, up to it, to be honest, or one particular director didn't think I was up to it. And he was wrong. And I just wanted to kind of prove him wrong. So I drove myself to Manchester and I sat outside for about two and a half hours until they saw me for five minutes and I drove back with my tails between my legs. And then I, they called me back about three weeks later and I sat around waiting again. And then they saw me and I you know, I auditioned and I kind of, um, I convinced them that I was the right person for the job. And to this date, I, um, I believe I was, and, I, and, and it's one of the jobs I'm most proud of. And do you think that the fact that you did arrive at that, being the lead role in that, in that show, do you think that changed everything in terms of, do you think from then on, um, you know, what, what followed it? First of all, it was a world production, wasn't it? Which was the people who did yes. kind of duty and then save me. Um, so presumably relationships were formed and just people saw you in this, in this, in this great role. I remember um, Tony Garnett, who ran World at that time, um, or um, was actually just leaving World at that time, but he was still very much the figurehead of the company, took me out to dinner. And, um, and I thought it was going to be one of those, everybody's around the table, but it wasn't. It was just me and him. And... Um, and one of the things he said to me at that dinner was that things could be different after buried and and that you, I, and he, he one of the things he said is you have to be very circumspect about the next job you say yes to and um and he was absolutely right i mean it i mean i wasn't again partly because i try as much as I can to living 
live in ignorance of myself. Um, I didn't I didn't overthink it, but um, I was aware that, you know, I was on the billboards. It was my face with, you know, selling buried. And I was aware that that wasn't typical or usual. It wasn't unheard of in any way, shape or form, but it wasn't kind of, you know, typical. And, um, and I was aware because there have been other points. I remember when I first came out of drama school, one of my early jobs out of drama school was a thing called Civvies that Linda LaPlante wrote. And after I did Civvies, Linda wrote um, uh, an, an, another thing for Channel 4 called Comics, and she put me in. And I remember very clearly walking into meetings and auditions after Comics, and things were different. People were reacting to you differently. They had a different perception of you. And that happened after Buried, and I had to navigate it. Um, I would also say that part of navigating life after Buried and after my first lead role in a television series was followed by my longest period of unemployment. So um, I don't know what that says, but that's what happened. Okay. Um, has, your, has your approach to acting changed from, you know, that period to now, would you say? You know, or did, when you're playing that role in Buried, do you, do you have any particular way of preparing for it? If it? As I say, it feels incredibly naturalistic and authentic as does, you know, if you think right up to this day, your work can save me. Or, but do, do you do things differently now at all? I, um, I don't fundamentally do things differently. I, I can move through the gears a little bit easier. It takes not less effort when you kind of get there, but, but you know, um, getting to the place where I need to get, I, I kind of know the roots which, um, you know, just comes with experience and, you know, and exercising those particular muscles. I just, my thing is, is just not to put too much stuff in the way, really. I mean, I don't, I don't particularly like talking too much about the process of acting because I think it's, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Paul Bettany has this kind of phrase. If it's not Paul Bettany and it's somebody else's, I apologise but he has this phrase that acting's a bit like sex. It's really fun to do, but it's a little bit embarrassing to talk about. And, yeah. um, and I very much am in that kind of school, really. I don't want to, you know, get too precious about it, but, you know, I, I read the scripts. That's, that's my thing. I read the scripts and read the scripts and read the scripts and read the scripts. And I read and I mark down things that other characters say about my character. And I mark down things that my character says about himself. And I use those fundamentally to create an internal and external kind of sense of myself. And then I get on with it. That's pretty much um, in, in the kind of bare bones, um, kind of how I get it done. I, um, I try not to, like I said, put anything in the way. I try not to get in my own way. I try and be as truthful as I possibly can. The actors that I most admire are the actors who play moment to moment, and I try and be one of those. And just before, before Barry, a few years before Barry, you, you wrote Storm Damage, the, the one-off drama, um, which um, was nominated, won some awards, nominated for awards, nominated for a BAFTA for Best Single Drama. Was that an example? I mean, that, you know, you, that was a success and was, you know, highly acclaimed. But A, how, how, why, did, why did you feel you need to tell that particular story? And also, why after that did you concentrate mostly on the acting? And it was a long time then after that, since you went back to the writing. Uh, um, wow, that's a big old question. I'm not sure Sorry. you know just how big it is, really. But <laughs> um, I wrote I wrote Storm Damage. Um, at the end of Storm Damage, there's a funeral, um, and it is the funeral of a 16 year old boy. And I wrote Storm Damage because I went because my family went to that funeral. And at that funeral, a, um, an elder um, uh, started speaking about his experience of being a black man in, the, in Britain and, and how that was different from the gen this 16 year old boys um, generation that was living in Britain. And he made a plea to the young people who were at this funeral not to make the mistake that this young man made, not to get into the situation that might lead to the end of your life at only 16 years old. And, um, and experiencing that, I, I 
the only way I could react to it was to try and write it down and, and give it license, give it voice. And that's what I tried to do with Storm Damage. Um, I, I was writing for the bill just before I, w I was writing for Storm Damage and one of the producers from the bill took me to the BBC and they asked me, did I have an idea? And I said, I got two ideas. One was one that was rooted in, it was a historical drama and one was about, uh, ended up, I mean, in today's terms, you would say it was about night crime. It wasn't, but you would say that it was. Um, and they were keen on the one about knife crime. And so I um, set about writing it and, but it took a really long time and it took six and a half years. And a lot of the delay was, was to do with the fact that it, I was trying to write a universal story told with black faces. And, um, and the people um, uh, in charge at the BBC at that particular point found that difficult found that complicated, didn't have an exam enough examples that had gone before it to believe that it could be successful. So it slightly got in the way. And again, you know, in the sense of my, me trying to be ignorant of myself, I didn't really know the, um, the effect that that journey from commission to, um, to it getting made and then it going out and the, uh, it getting figures that impress the people who care about figures and it getting nominated for awards. I wasn't really aware of how that, what that journey took out of me. But I forgot loads of things about it until somebody was asking me about it the other day. And I remember, it's very weird. I'm only, I'm only saying it because I forgot it, but it was part of the journey and it did have an effect on me. I remember being at a BAFTA, um, a, not a BAFTA, being at a the BBC writers party that you got invited got invited to and um and this is there was a, quite a few things that had kind of gone on before but i remember going to this bbc writers party after we were nominated for a bafta for storm damage and coming across a writer who had already been nominated like four times for a bafta and had won it i believe twice and i thought he was going to walk up to me and congratulate me because i kind of knew knew him I was a young writer. I was in my mid, mid twenties, I believe, or something like that. And he said to me, "You only got nominated because you were black." Oh. And I was like, I was, I was stunned, and I walked away. And I didn't, again, I didn't really know how to react to it. I was, I was pretty much the only black face in the room that wasn't serving. And. Um, and I said, to, I remember saying to Tony Marchant and Tony Grounds, who I knew and was talking to and saying um, what, this writer had, what this writer had said, and both of them just wanted to go over and smack him. And I was like, is that what I should have, is that the reaction I was supposed to have? And Tony Marchant, you know, back in the day, used to be a bit of a, bit of a boxer and knows his way around um, throwing a punch. And it, it became the topic of whether or not we should go over and give him a slap. But it... Um, but it was part of, you know, all that went into getting storm damage made and all of that. And, and, um, and it did have an effect on me. And because I had had an effect as a writer, but because I had acting and the acting was going quite well, thank you very much. It was, um, it made, it made it easier to put the writing on the back burner, I suppose. Although in my head, I was always writing something. Right. I just wasn't putting it down on paper, really. Brilliant. You don't want to name that, um, that horrendous man who said you're only one because you're black. I'm not um, No, no. <laughs> I, I, actually, I just, you know, on, on two levels, really. I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to do that to him. And also, I don't want people to know his name. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. You did, you went to America, as they say, you, you, you and, and made a pretty incredible success of it. You're in, um, Jericho, I remember, which, you know, went on for a few seasons, didn't it? Was that, was, was the decision to go to, was that a conscious big decision for you? Or was it just something that kind of ended up making sense and that there are opportunities out there and you tried it and it worked and you stayed for a while? It was a little bit, bit of, a little bit of both, really. Um, I had um, um, the opportunity to go to America um, and a number of times before, over the 10 years before I went. Um, 
to be honest, I was working um, well and often in the UK, didn't really see the need to leave. There were, um, I had my ambition at that particular point was in, was in the UK. I had young kids. I um, wanted them to grow up in London. I wanted them to be Londoners. Um, and America, particularly LA and Hollywood, if I'm really honest, scared me. It all seemed a bit big. It all seemed a bit, you know, a bit grand. It all seemed a bit, I mean, you know, all you, all I really knew of it was ghost stories or fantastical stories and, and all of that. I wasn't, again, I was living in ignorance of the place. And um, ultimately in the end, you know, two things happened, um, buried on one level and the period of unemployment that followed. Um, and also I had a really bad accident and um, damaged my knee greatly and was out of action for, um, for most, of the, most of a year, really trying to rebuild my, my leg and learn how to walk again and suddenly realized just, you know, how precarious the life of an actor was in the UK. And, um, uh, uh, and I just needed to open up the horizons. Um, and so I took an op the opportunity of going to America with a film um, that I had did um, when it premiered in America, a film called Sahara. I got, um, it was, and from then on in, it was pretty kind of conventional. I got an agent. I went back to the UK. My agent phoned up and said, would you come over and let me show you what we can do for you? I went for, we agreed again because of the rules that we had about how long we could be away from our kids. Um, he asked for six weeks. I said, I'll do it in two, three week jumps so that I could get home to see my kids in between. And, um, but as luck would have it, um, I was pretty much done and dusted and signed up to a television series after two weeks. So I came home and, um, and then went back to shoot the pilot of the show, which was Jericho and then went back to shoot the television uh, to shoot the series of it. And, um, and then when it got picked up for a second season, um, the time spent away from wife and kids was a bit long. So we decided to move to the States for a couple of years. And so you move and your kids go to school and they make friends and their ambitions then are, go, are to go to American colleges. And so we stayed and we kept putting back the point of which we would leave and come back to the UK. So we'll do it after they've, you know, the eldest has done her A-levels or we'll do it once they've done their O-levels. Oh no, we'll do it after they've done, they've graduated high school because, you know, um, uh, like I said, American colleges. And then before you know it, you've been here 12 years. And, um, and that's the way that it kind of worked out. How did you find the experience of being in a big American show, you know, in terms of the number of episodes that they make per season and, the way that everyone is aware, of, you know, of every show that goes out, prime time on whatever network, it's a whole unique situation, isn't it? Did you did you enjoy that, or, or, or did you find it difficult? Um, I found it difficult. There were bits of it I enjoyed. There were bits of it that um, that got on my nerves, and there were bits of it that you just had to navigate, really. And it was a kind of learning experience. I tell you, one of the things I did. I remember before I came to America, a mate of mine had gone over there, and then he had. And he was, you know, quite a, is quite a, you know, a, uh, a popular actor in the UK. And he went over there and he just went, I didn't like it. No one knew who I was. I was walking in the room and it was like, you know, I was just starting all over again. And, and he hated it. I loved that. I, I have to say that one of the things that I, that I most enjoyed about coming to America was, was it was a clean slate. I mean, they kind of knew me from Snatch. They kind of knew me from um, 24 hour party people. Outside of that, um, they had no idea who I was. And I'd suddenly, you know, I went when I was 40, 41, something like that. And I dropped in front of them fully formed and, you know, all right at my, all right at my job. And I just went at it. I never told so many lies in my life than when I first arrived in LA. If I was going up for a part to play a soldier, I told them all I was a soldier. What were they going to do? Call me a liar? They didn't know me. So I just, I relished it and took it as a, a way of reinvigorating myself and challenging myself all over again. And the rest of it, I just, again, I just 
I mean, I'm, I'm kind of saying this over and over again, but it, it kind of slightly works for me. I just remained in ignorance of loads of things. You know, when they were, you know, talking about um, doing the first 13 episodes and then getting the back nine for network television, I, you know, I was petrified of playing a character for that amount of time. So I just, you know, found a way of, of working my way through it. I'd go into the writer's room and I'd go to the showrunners and the writers and go, you got to do something interesting with my character, otherwise I'm going to get bored and get into trouble. So come on. And, um, and you know, and I just, you know, I just took a punt because I, on one level, I had nothing to lose. You know, I didn't go over there. I didn't go to America in a, with a sense of, you know, it's make or break for me. I was like, I'm going to give it a go. If it works out, it works out. And if it doesn't, I'll go home and work there because I worked there before. So, you know, I just, I, I just went for it. I just didn't, I, you know, I just got on with it in the, in the best way, in the best way that I could really. And, um, and so far touch wood, it's kind of um, working out for me, but it's um, yeah. I mean, I, a lot of the stuff around it, it's a thing that mostly kind of surprised me. Most of the stuff around it, the stuff that frightened me initially about going to LA, being a you know a one industry town, most of, quite a lot of it I could blow blow it off. I made I made good friends and had good friends in LA, and we looked out for each other and we looked after each other. And I know I never could have got through it without them, and you know particularly before my family arrived. And there were people who had done the trip before, you know, people like Marianne Jean-Baptiste and Trevor Etienne and Gary McDonald and um, Raz Adoti and Sabra Wilson Williams. They had all gone before and they were there when we went. So when I landed, I had mates there and they looked after me, literally gave me their couch, gave, let me stay in their spare room, fed me, um, you know, encouraged me, supported me. And I, I genuinely, I couldn't have done it if they weren't there to help me. Hmm. You talked about playing the same character for a few years. You, you've been playing Morgan in the Walking Dead universe for 10 years now. Um, and A, can you quite believe that? How, you know, is it it's still fulfilling for you? And I know that you've just, I just watched your, the second episode of the new season that you've directed. Was, is that an important kind of turning point in, in this? Or just an important way of keeping you interested and excited by the character in the um, world? It's weird. And I always have to say to people when they say you've been playing Morgan for 10 years, that it's both true and not true. Um, in the first five years um, of the franchise, I only did three episodes. So um, I'm not, I don't know why I feel the need to say that. I think it's more for me than it is for anybody else. But um, no, I never would have believed that I would have been associated or still playing a, a character um, uh, after all this time. Um, and part of that is testament to the character that they've created. And part of it is about how they've navigated and nurtured that character because I, and I'm really surprised that I'm saying this out loud, um, but it's a character that still interests me. It's a character that, um, that still challenges me. It's a character that I'm still finding, finding out about. And I know that could sound ridiculous, but it is. And, they, you know, and just when I thought it was over and I was ready for it to be over, you know, they, um, they moved the character, they, they offered the chance of moving the character over to the spin-off show. And, um, and, and at that particular point, I couldn't think of another actor who had been offered that opportunity in a in a television show to to do what they were asking me to do. So I couldn't say no to it. So I said yes. Um, so yeah, it's very uh, it's very unusual doing that. Directing to a certain extent is a bit like going to America. Is that um, people have been asking me, uh, "Are you interested in being a director for years? For easily." 15, nearly 20 years, people have been either asking me, are you interested in being a director? Or I've had a number of, of um, first assistant directors who have gone, when you direct your first film, I'd love to be the first, uh, first AD on it. Or DOPs kind of saying to me, when you direct your first film, you know, I'd love to you know, be considered as a, you know, a DOP, I, you know, I'd like to help you with it. 
Um, so it was been something that's been bubbling around and I've been putting it aside again, partly out of fear, um, partly out of ignorance. And then we, um, uh, we were in between seasons of, of, um, of, uh, we'd just come out of the second season of Save Me and I was going back to the show and I, and, it, and I, I knew I was clear and all I was doing was focusing on, on the show and I, didn't have a outstanding writing project at that time. Um, so I took the showrunners up on their offer of, you know, if you fancy directing an episode at any point, um, we would be open to that. And I said at the beginning of the season, I'd like to take you up on it. And they gave me the second episode. They didn't even wait around and give me any time to, to ease myself into it. They went, bang, here it is. And, um, and I'm really glad I did, did it. I, I don't know entirely what I've learned from it and I don't know I, I know I'm I, I know I want to do it again um and I, but I probably should do it again on this show um just because of the environment and figuring out what I learned and what I didn't learn and what more I need to know but it is something that I enjoyed and will probably do again do you have do, how much creative freedom do you have on, on a huge big show like that when you're directing it do you, you know is, do you is it could you express yourself, if you like, creatively in that in that role as, as much as you there want? Are, there are places you can. One of the things, I don't know if it's true because I haven't directed on any other show. It, I do know that in the, the scripts that I write in order to give to um, directors, I'm not as prescriptive and descriptive as scripts are on The Walking Dead. The showrunners, I think because you have such a short period of time to film these things, um, um, the scripts on Walking Dead and Fear the Walking Dead are almost like a shot sheet. I mean, they are telling you what you need to see. They're telling you what size you need to see it in. They are telling you when you're going wide, when you're close, when you're mid, when you're, you know, that it is really, really detailed in that way, which kind of freaks you out but when you suddenly realize you've just got eight days to do this massive show that has stunts and walkers and prosthetics and cgi um at times you're kind of thankful for it but there are moments where um it, it's up to you so they have um a teaser which is the um the bit before the titles and on my episode um the story we were telling in the teaser was also an introduction to a group of actors and characters that you'd never met before in a location that you'd never met before. So I got to create what that was and shoot it in the way that I wanted to shoot it along with um, Adam Shashinsky, who was my DOP and my wingman, or I was his wingman. It depended on what day it was. And, um, and we got to work it out and shoot it in the way that we wanted to work it out and shoot it. And that part of the episode feels all ours. Um, and and it's, one of, it's one of the parts that I'm most proud of. So there are periods, but you are, the role of a director on American television, on most American television, is very different than it is back home in the UK. Right. Um, what was the key element factor in getting Save Me um, commissioned and created by you. you, you exec produced it, you starred in it, you wrote it, um, all the while while you're still, you know, in the Walking Dead universe as well. Um, but was there one key factor in getting that, that show made? It was one key factor and two people, and that was Anne Mensah and Jessica Sykes. Anne Mensah was head of um, drama at the time at um, Sky, and Jess Sykes is my literary editor, I mean, literary manager, and, and went on to be my co-exec producer of Save Me. And, um, and if it wasn't for Anne making a phone call to Jess and saying, why isn't Lenny writing and how do we get him writing again? And my agent calling her on it and saying, commission him and then we, he will. Um, and then, you know, supporting me through it and navigating me through it. Um, save me never would have happened. I mean, it's it's without question down to the down to the two of them really, and particularly because I was as we went through the process um, and chaperoned it and nurtured it and protected it um, all the way along the process while it was at 
um, while it was at Sky. It was her suggestion that myself and Jess became exec producers. Um, it was her suggestion that uh, it was under her um, control that Sky commissioned us directly. So we already had the network and it was our option of who was the production company that we worked with, which put us in a, a very powerful position um, as far as project, protecting our idea. But also, you know, because I was in America, Jess had to be, you know, my surrogate and, um, and my representative in many rooms that I, I couldn't be in and had to, you know, both speak for herself and speak for me. And, and, and it wouldn't have been able to, it just wouldn't have happened without the two of them. Did you, did, you, did you arrive at the tone of Save Me quite easily? Like it's got, it's quite, quite, because on the one hand, it, it, it could be a, a genre piece, you know, a, a thriller, fi uh, someone finding their lost daughter, trying to find their lost daughter. But on the other hand, it's very poetic and lyrical and you know, kind of beautiful visually, the way it depicts, you know, this, this world, this, this, this state in London, etc. Was that what you, what you were going for? And how easy did you, did you find it to, to arrive at that? Um, Again, this is a really big but interesting question. Um, in the main, it was just what was in my head. And I'm not uh, blowing, up, blowing it off or making a simple answer, but it was just what was in my head. The way that people speak is the way that I hear them speaking in my head. The, 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 the tone of it, I never sat at any point or um, with anybody until we were making it, where any where we had a conversation about, you know, um, setting uh, about the tone because it was just the, for me. Um, if we got the pub right, everything else would look after itself. If we got the estate right, everything else would look after itself. If I made if I got the pub and the estate the way I saw it in my head, all of the other stuff. Would take care would take care of itself because that was our home that was our precinct that is the heart of save me for me um and it sounds considering where we are now and be considering the research we did and and what we ended up de depicting the the story of the missing child wasn't the focus for me that's not the story i was trying to tell i was trying to tell this other story through the story of a missing child I was trying to tell this other story through the genre of a thriller. And it was, it was about how people care about each other. It's about how people live next door to each other. It's about what community looks like in, you know, in the 2000s and how it's changed, but how it's ultimately stayed the same and what it, what it looks like at this, this stage of the 21st century in a small part of Southeast London. And my focus more than anything was about trying to be true to that neck of the woods, really. And um, as far as I saw it, as far as it was in, was in my head. And that, that very much was what I was after, you know, and I did and do spend a huge amount of the writing time honing down the words my characters speak. But it, it's, it's not about, for me, it's not about artifice. It's not about, oh, I just want them to be kind of poetic. It's not. It's about me trying to explain their, um, the inner dialogue they're having and the choices that they're, trying, that they're choosing to speak out loud. And, and that there, there is a code to that um, because they are speaking to people they are connected to because despite the things that might separate them, race, gender, sexuality, all of those things, they have a commonality and it's about them communi communicating that, that which they share, not that which they don't. And you, we work with directors, Nick Murphy directed series one, Jim Loach and Koki Gedrick series two. What, what, what do they have in common? What are you looking for um, in a director of Save Me? Um, they understood what was going on in my head, even though it wasn't necessarily worlds that they were kind of familiar with they are they had the they all have the ability to tell big stories in small places they understand character um they understand um uh subtlety 
um, and they under, and they know how to move the camera and when not to move the camera and they know when to um, when to call cut and when not to call cut and to let things breathe and also they love actors and um, and a large part of of save me um, are the actors and how they have um, made the characters that myself and um, Marlon and Daniel and Ema have kind of brought to life by writing them. They they've they grabbed them, you know, um, by the short and curlies and really inhabited them. And they were allowed to, and they were encouraged to. And a lot of that came from um, Nick initially, but certainly from Koki and Jim later on. And did it in the end, you know, did it in the end come out as you as it was in your head? Did what was in your head end up on screen for you, pretty much? Um, large parts of it, yeah, and but also large parts of it were more than I thought it it could be. I have to be absolutely honest. There were parts of it where I was like, "Wow, um, that's you know, that's much more." And I mean, I know it wasn't always easy for the you know for production, and I know it wasn't always easy for um, for the actors and the and the and the crew because you know sometimes they were waiting around. Well, not waiting around, but um, the scripts weren't always delivered as they would conventionally be de delivered if the person writing them wasn't filming in a um, a show in another country and wasn't always or, and wasn't also acting in the show that he was writing. But um, but one of the things that it did give me, even on the f the first season, um, was that as I was writing the scripts they were more populated and the characters were more well-rounded than they were when I started writing, when I was writing the first episode. When I was writing the first episode, um, you know, all of the characters were characters of my invention. Um, when I was writing four, five and six, they were Stevie Graham and Saran Jones and Jason Fleming and Tom Coombs and Susan Lynch. Uh, you know, they were people and um and they were fully rounded characters and so um it really helped me as kind of uh, as as a writer but um yeah the act the actors and the way that they went for the role and the way that they invested in creating the world um and also the supporting artists i have to say um particularly those in the pub and those in the estate they really they really invested in what we were trying to do and took and took ownership of it and um, and they made a huge difference. They really did. Well, it turned out pretty uh, pretty well, I think. Yeah, we did all right. <laughs> we did, we did. I've got. Uh, I should go to our um, viewers' questions in a sec. I haven't even. Uh, I've got to ask. Well, save me three. Is that still a go? Is that? Have you got in your head another? The, um, uh, the kind of lockdown and and shutdown um, has has had an effect of not being incredibly creative for me. Um, and also changing the dynamics of how we can we can do a season three, but season three is still something we're thinking about working on and um, trying to navigate. And you did you did start. I didn't even mention Line of Duty. I skipped over that. But did you did you learn much from Jim Mercurio, particularly on that show? Or was it did you, was it just a you know a, a, a great a great job, a great acting job, a great character? Um, it was a great job. It was a great acting job. It was a great character. And I did learn loads from Jed Mercurio. I mean, I've said this a number of times. I think Jed puts together an hour of television better than anybody else in the business virtually. And, um, and I, and I've tried to um, uh, um, follow his lead to a certain extent. I mean, we, you know, we're very different um, writers and we focus on it in very different ways. Jed is the really kind of, he gets into the minutiae of worlds. That's his thing. It's the police, it's the hospitals, it's, you know, it's different areas of, 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 uh, of healthcare. And, and he finds dark stories in those places. Mine, I don't do institutions nearly as well as, as, as Jed does, but um, he knows how to end an episode and he knows how to make you want to come back for another. And I tried to, steal that from him and i'm unashamed about about that absolutely right um i've got a question from joy coker 
who says, what have you taken away from this year with COVID-19, Black Lives Matter and the entertainment industry shutting down that will influence you going forward? I have a, Jesus, that's a big question. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what I've taken away from Black Lives Matter. I don't understand why that phrase is so frightening to white people. I don't understand in any way, shape or form why a statement that's, that says, by the way, Black Lives Matter somehow is a huge threat. I was listening to a, 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 um, a podcast that I listened to out here called um, This American Life. And, mm. they, and one of the reporters was following a white militia around Detroit and Michigan during the, um, the, on election day. And they, and they were walking around and there were two groups that they were hoping to come into contact with. And those two groups were um, Antifa, what the hell, whoever they are, which, but they had decided that they would be able to notice them because they'd all be dressed in black. And the other group they were trying to find is the Black Lives Matter group. And I just can't understand, I genuinely can't understand why that's so threatening to people and why somehow that they've, that a group that is basically just saying um, your, your policies and your actions are threatening our lives and could you please pay attention to that somehow has made them into, depending on where you are, a, you know, a, a, a violent group. I don't, I, I don't understand that at all. And as far as Corona is concerned, I think the thing I've taken most away from it, as I think a number of us have, is just how connected we all are. That we are, you know, this incident was happening in every single country across the world and we were all experiencing it at the same time. And, um, and we were affected by it at the same time. And we were infected by it at the same time. And, um, and yeah, it was just about how connected we are. We don't stand on our own islands. We are, we are one and we should use that going forward. And I hope that the stories that my industry takes on board and the way in which my industry gets its job done. In, when we went back filming, we were back filming now on Fear the Walking Dead. One of the things I said on the first day of filming is that we are community. Wearing a mask is an act of community. I do it to protect you. I don't do it to protect me. And that we have to remember as a, as a world that we are community. Hmm. Uh, Connor Porter asks, what's your process if you find yourself getting blocked in a scene where it needs big, a big emotional moment, i.e. tears or despair, etc.? Does that happen? Do you get blocked? Mm -hmm. It does, but I don't, I mean, I'm never trying to produce tears because that's a weird situation to be in if I'm getting blocked it's because I'm not thinking right so I try and figure out what is blocking my my thoughts it's like you know an actor said to me once and he's absolutely right you don't when you're forgetting your lines it's not that you're forgetting your lines you know your lines because you've learned them it's that you're forgetting the thoughts and that's what's blocking you because you don't know what you're thinking next and therefore you've got no idea what you're saying next so if I do find myself getting blocked I try and find time to go and figure out what's going on in my head. What am I thinking at that point that's getting, into, getting in the way? And, and more often than not, if you start that way, you can navigate it. Uh, Sydney Edwards asks, did you struggle, do you struggle with self-confidence at all? And how did you learn to believe in yourself and to overcome the knockbacks? Um, I was an incredibly sh shy kid. And, um, and at heart, I'm a, very shy man. I find it very strangely, considering the job I do, I find it very difficult going into new situations or meeting new people. Um, and the way that I nav navigate it is I hold tight to my family and I hold tight to my friends. I don't have a huge circle of friends. I have a small circle of very close friends that would walk through fire for me and I would walk through fire for them. And the same is with my family. And that's where I find confidence. That's where I find solace. And that's where I navigate from. If I'm on set and, um, and, and I'm finding it difficult or, or I'm about to enter into a situation that I find um, uh, a little bit overwhelming, you know, like first days of filming, first days of, you know, read throughs or first day of rehearsals, things like that. Um, I listen to music 
as as I can and just try and settle myself down. I try and listen to a little bit of Otis or a little bit of Aretha or jump up and down to the specials. And that kind of settles my soul. I know who I am then. Brilliant. Um, Leanna Benjamin asks, thank you so much. This has been incredibly useful. Is there a part that you would love to play or a story you would love to write? Um, at some point when I get old enough, I'd like to play Leah. Um, um, uh, I'd quite like to do that. Um, are there stories I'd like to tell? Yeah, there are. I mean, there's, there's a, it, I'd like to do my version of a period drama populated by um, a, a more realistic sense of what people certainly in London might have looked like in times gone by um, and not not as by way of making overt political statement but by way of trying to tell the truth of the situation and finding a story that enables that and um, that's one of the things I'm working on there's a boxing story that I've got in my head that I just can't shake um, that I that I want to um, that I want to tell so I'm lucky in that sense that the stories I want to tell, I have the possibility of being able to tell them. It's just a matter of time, really. And um, and as for parts I want to play, um, you know, I'm open to whatever's on offer, really. But, you know, if it's a part that's kind of gone before, you know, um, there are a couple classic roles that I'd like to test myself against. You, you, King Lear, I want to see your King Lear, definitely, yeah, that would be. Yeah, well, you know, I'm a father of three daughters. I think I've got a, wow. a, a, a connection with the fella. 100%. Uh, Luis Adriano asks, really interested in hearing more about your writing process. Do you set yourself discipline time to do it, or do you just write when you get the ideas in your head? I used to write in the middle of the night when everybody had gone to bed and there was nothing on television that I wanted to watch. Um, I've now got a bit more, I've had to get a bit more grown up about it. So um, I write um, during the day. I, I see it very much as a kind of nine to five and kind of force myself to do it. I remember seeing an interview with, I think it was Ben Elton. And he just had this really simple phrase when somebody said, the interviewer asked him, you know, what advice would you give to um, to writers who um, are finding it difficult. And he said, writers write. That's what you do. And, and that's what I try to do. If I write a page, if I write a line, if I write a scene, if I write half an act, um, I try and on days when I've got writing to do, I will sit down and write and not put too much pressure on myself about how much I write, just that I write. Um, and that's what I, that's what I mostly try to do. And a successful day for me is a day in which I've written anything. <laughs> Fair enough. And I think probably this is be the last one we've got time for. Cameron uh, Robertson asks, as an experienced actor and writer, have you found that acting has helped with writing or vice versa? Um, I'm, I don't write as an actor and I don't act as a writer. So I am i don't go on the set of, you know, like Walking Dead or Fear. And if I have issues with a scene, um, I'm not doing that as a writer. I think that would be hugely disrespectful and stuff. I, I is enough stuff I have to work on as an actor in that situation. So I don't, I don't do it that, that way around, but, um, Having said that, when I was writing Save Me, as when I was writing Storm Damage and any, any of the things that I've um, written, um, I do have a sense of, particularly with Save Me, because that's the most recent one, I, I did have a sense that I wanted to create parts that would excite actors. Regardless of size or involvement, I wanted to write parts that actors would feel that what they were contributing had value and that it was something that they could invest in. It was something that they could strive for. It was something that they could match themselves against. So I was, I was kind of aware of that, but went like, you know, I've said this to you before Boyd, but 
you know, when we were filming Save Me, once I was on the set playing Nelly, I was no longer the writer of the show. If the other cast members had questions about the scene, um, they were directed to the, to the directors and the answers were given by the directors. And if there was an issue that needed the writers, that they needed my input, then we would leave set, go away, talk in a corner and then come back and the director would give the answer still because it was important to have a clear separation because otherwise you, you end up being a jack of all and master of none. Yeah. Um, I, just, I want to fit this question actually, hopefully with a few minutes. Kona Moraes asks, were there any black actors or influencers, I guess they wouldn't have been called influencers back then, who you looked up to when you first entered the game? Yeah, I mean, I was lucky there was loads and they quite liked me. So uh, there was, I mean, I, there was a, a long list. It was um, Guy Gregory. When I did my first play at The Man in the Moon, I had come up from the National Youth Theatre. Somebody, had, actually a mate of mine, Gary McDonald, had dropped out of a play at The Man in the Moon. And they gave me a part in there. And one of the actors was a guy called Guy Gregory, who was a African-American actor working in London. He took me under his wing and looked after me, at, even at times when I didn't know that he was looking after me. Um, Norman Beaton, as I said before, Horace Ove, um, Tony Armour Trading, I mean, uh, Stefan Khalifa, Oscar James. There were a lot of Hugh Quashy. There were George Harris. There were loads of um, older actors and actresses, you know, um, uh, who, who were who were there and who were um, ha seemed happy that I was around and took time to um, look out for me and look after me to varying different degrees. Mona Hammond, um, Corinne Skiller, Skinner Carter. There was, there were Isabel Lucas. There were a, there were a few, um, there were a few who were there and 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 had gone before and um, and on whose shoulders certainly my generation and all generations since um, that we stand on. I did the last, the last play, I, I'll just say this, um, I did Norman Beaton's last play, a, um, a play called The Coup at, um, at, at the National Theatre. And um, it was a play about a, a coup in Trinidad, my family are from Trinidad, and it centered around the um, um, kind of deposed president of the country who was in a prison cell being guarded over by a young soldier. I played the young soldier and Norman played the ex prime minister. And, the, and we, between us, mostly Norman kind of carried that play all the way through. And, um, and it was the point where my family, up until that point, even though I was doing a play at the National, up until that point, my family was still worried about me. And, and my foster mother would regularly ask me, um, you know, am I gonna get a proper job? And, um, and it wasn't until that play, and because my foster mother's generation knew Norman because he was off their generation, and that he took her to the side and said um, that he thought that Lenny was gonna be all right, that it put my family's mind at rest and um, they stopped asking for me to go out and get a proper job. Wow, that's... Well, that is a fantastic place to win. I think that's a, that's a that's a brilliant story. Thanks so much for um, answering all my questions, and thanks to everyone for asking their questions. Lenny, and um, congratulations on everything you've done and everything that's coming up. <laughs> and, Thank you uh, very thanks, much. thanks for thanks for thanks for doing this. Thanks for being the other half of it. Absolute pleasure, and thanks to BAFTA for organising the whole thing. Yes, thank Cheers, you. Lenny. Thank you. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye.